We are called to worship this morning with praise for God's holiness from Psalm 99, verse 2 through 5. <clears throat> the Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Mighty King, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Lord our God, worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Our first hymn is from the blue hymnal, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. It is number 138. Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weakness, since in every respect he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of compassion, in Jesus Christ, you reveal the light of your glory, but we turn away, distracted by our own plans. We confess that we speak when we should listen and act when we should wait. Forgive our aimless enthusiasms. Grant us wisdom to live in your life and to follow in the way of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let us now confess our individual sins against God in silent prayer of confession. <clears throat> These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. 
and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. I invite you to pass the friendship pad located on the center aisle. As we do so, we reflect the oneness of the body of Christ as we gather for worship this Sunday morning. For those of you who are guests and visitors, uh, in front of you in the pew rack is a red ribbon. We invite you to put that on so that others sitting in front or behind you may acknowledge you as a guest or visitor this Sunday morning. I invite you, uh, if, you, if time permits, your schedule permits, for you to stay for a few minutes of uh, coffee and fellowship in the bar from Paula, a room to my right, to your left as you would exit the sanctuary. A special welcome to those of you who worship with us by way of WNCN-TV. We are First Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. We're located across from the state capitol. If your schedule permits and the near future for you to come to Raleigh, we look forward to you worshiping with us here in this sanctuary. We're thankful for your prayers, and we're thankful for your financial contributions, which make this special ministry possible. If you're here this Sunday and you're looking for a church home, we invite you to join with us in Christian fellowship and service. There's a place to check on the friendship pad, your interest in membership, your interest in receiving information. There is an officer present each Sunday in the Anderson Session Room who is prepared to talk with you about how one becomes a member by transfer of letter, reaffirmation of faith, or by profession of faith in Jesus Christ. This Sunday, as the session met, it was our privilege to receive into life and fellowship the following individuals, and I invite them to come forward at this time. First, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Richard A. Mooring, Dick and Carol Ann. The elder sponsor is Cal Parks. Dick and Carol Ann come by transfer of letter from First Presbyterian Church of Charlotte, North Carolina. If you can come up and get on the far side, please, over there. Thank you. Dick and Carol Ann have two children, uh, Jennifer, who goes by Jenna, and Alex. Next, Mr. Board Wilson is the eldest sponsor for our family. Kim Pierce, who will be re uh, received this morning by profession of faith. She'll be confirmed. Kim, why don't you come on this side, please? Her parents, Neil and Barbara Pierce, were restored to the active role from the inactive role by reaffirmation of faith. Next, Mr. and Mrs. Warren Williams, Warren and Joy. The elder sponsor is Mr. Lewis Lamb. Warren joins by transfer from the Benson Baptist Church in Benson, North Carolina, and Joy by transfer from the Grove Presbyterian Church in Dunn, North Carolina. And next, Mr. and Mrs. William H. W. Crawford IV, Bill and Elizabeth. The elder sponsor is Mr. Perrin Howe. Bill joins by transfer from the Bruton Parish <coughs> Church in Williamsburg. That painting is in the, uh, the Episcopal Church is in the Balkan Paul, if you'd like to see a rendition of it. And Elizabeth joins by transfer from the First Baptist Church of Petersburg, Virginia. Is that first or second? Excuse me. First, okay. Thank you. Friends, you've been received into the membership of this congregation from another, or you've been restored to the active role, or you'll be making a profession of faith. And so we welcome you as brothers and sisters in the name of Jesus Christ. We are members of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and because of this, you do not come to us as strangers, but as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Paul, in the epistle to the Romans in the fourth chapter, affirms the unity which is ours in Jesus Christ when he writes, there is one body and one spirit, one God and Father of us all who is above all and through all and in all. I address this question to you. Do you promise to be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way, and by so doing, fulfilling your calling as a disciple of Jesus Christ the Lord? Will you answer, I do. I do. Now, Dr. Ella will give the, the words of the liturgy for Kim Pierce, who is to be received by profession of faith. 
Kim, in presenting yourself for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ and you show that you want to study him, to know him, love him, and serve him as one of his chosen people. Please show your intent by answering the following questions. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Do you trust in him? I do. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation? giving of yourself in every way, and will you seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may be? Okay. Kim, will you kneel, please, for the confirmation prayer? It is significant that Neil and Barbara Pierce many years ago presented Kim for the sacrament of baptism, and they are standing with her. She is now confirming the vows taken for her many years ago as she makes a profession of faith and is confirmed to the body of Christ this Sunday morning. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask your blessing on this, your child, Kim Pierce, who as a young adult is confirming the vows made for her many years ago. And we're thankful for the love and the nurture of your spirit which has worked through her family and through this community of faith. For we have been her godparents. We have been those who have enabled her through the years to know of your faith and to know of your grace and strength that you are her Savior. Now bless her as she confirms these words taken many years ago on her behalf. As her parents presented her, so she presents herself to you to confess that you are her Lord and her Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. Dr. Ella, will you have the closing statement in prayer, please? Let us again look to God in prayer. God, our Father, we praise you for calling us together to be a servant people and for gathering us all into the body of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for choosing to add to our number this day these brothers and sisters in the faith. Together, may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. We are thankful for your presence and for your joining this community of faith and extend to you the welcome. Dr. Ella, as he is presenting the certificates, uh, provides me the opportunity to encourage you to come forward at the close of the service. Now, that will be a little while. We have to have a congregational meeting first. But after that, please come forward and extend the right hand of fellowship to these, our new members who have been received to the life and fellowship of our congregation this Sunday morning. Thank you. May proceed on down. Elizabeth and Bill, thank you. Welcome. Welcome to Eden. Our uh, Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Exodus chapter 34, <laughs> verses 39 through 35. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hands, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture lesson comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3. We're reading 
verse 12 through chapter 4, verse 2. The apostle has just described the glory of the hope that we have in Christ through the new covenant. And he commences with verse 12, writing these words. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. Not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened, indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old co Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. Our next hymn is number 485, To God Be the Glory. And we will dismiss the children kindergarten through grade three for Children's Church during the singing of this hymn. Our gospel lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, reading from the ninth chapter, verses 28 through 36, as we consider for our topic on this Sunday, the Transfiguration of the Lord. Verses 28 through 36, the biblical basis for the topic, reflecting whose glory, God's or ours. Hear now the word of God. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, 
which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent. And in those days told no one any of these things that they had seen. The word of the Lord, thanks be unto God. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts this day be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Reflecting whose glory? God's or ours? Clouds have always fascinated me. And this next Friday, while traveling to Montreat for the All Church Retreat, I'm sure that if it follows true to form on Friday afternoon when we get to an area close to Montreat, Old Fort, that it'll be raining, that the clouds will come down, and that mountain will be obscured as we attempt to go up the mountain. Clouds both fascinate me and scare me, I must admit. I am awed when I see clouds from such a pinnacle as Mount Mitchell, the highest peak east of the Mississippi River, or from an overlook on one of the highways through the mountains, seeing clouds hovering in the valleys, or seeing clouds covering peaks or ridges. It is eerie but inspiring because it seems as though heaven has touched earth, and I am participating in that. Clouds somehow representing the glory in the presence of God. Well, our scriptures speak about the glory of God in a very intensive way, for where a cloud appeared with light, there was the transcendent power of God. Our scriptures this day, in a lectionary for this Sunday, the Transfiguration of the Lord, speak to the issue of glory. Whose glory? God's or ours, and why? Our gospel lesson suggests that God's glory acts for us in the mission of Jesus as Messiah. In the common vernacular today, glory is not a word we use a lot, except in a derogatory way, because it so often is used to people who are conceited. He or she is a glory hound, or he or she seeks glory. People do this for their glory. Glory has power and it attracts and it has influence. And sometimes people do the right things but for the wrong reason because they do it for self-glory. And, and we witness that we don't like that, particularly if we're being used for somebody else's glory. I can't imagine uh, Coach Smith of UNC or Coach Robinson for the Wolfpack or Coach K from Duke allowing those egos to run rampant on their teams, people who are glory hounds. It would not be a team if egos ran rampant and people are out there solely for self-glory. However, Scripture, when it uses glory, talks about glory in a different way. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are different words for glory. In the Old Testament, the term for glory connotes honor as well as power. And in the New Testament, the word doxa means power and manifestation or presence. But it is never a power and a presence which serves God. It is a power and a presence of God for human beings. Whenever there is the glory of God, it is awe-inspiring, but that benevolent power acts on behalf of you and me. That's the witness of Scripture. And so it is, as our Luke lesson gives us today to consider. Jesus has gone on the mountain. He does that often to pray. He takes with him Peter, James, and John, and in the midst of what goes on there, God comes in glory, and Jesus is transfigured, meaning by that his appearance changes and he becomes as white and bright as a sun. And who appears but two heroic figures from Israel's past, Moses and Elijah. They, too, come in glory, and they are talking with Jesus about his departure. 
Now, in the, in the Greek, that word refers to the meaning of exodus. Jesus will depart from Jerusalem. What does that mean? There is the encouragement of God and the reinforcement by Moses and Elijah that what will occur in Jerusalem will be an exodus. For Jesus will die. His death will be an exodus. He will be raised, and that will be part of the exodus. Jesus will lead an exodus for you and me by what he does. The glory of God will act on behalf of you and me. Jesus gets that encouragement both from God and from Moses and Elijah. And so the theology of this passage gets at this point that what occurs here in God's glory is for the sake of you and me. Moses had led an exodus out of Egypt for the children of Israel, out of bondage. Moses had come down from Mount Sinai with the tablets, his face so brilliant that he put, had to put a veil on so that he would not terrify the Israelites. Elijah had not died like an ordinary human being, but had been taken spirited up into the heavens as a cloud, meaning the presence of God. The scriptures talk about the glory of God. Paul, who at one point in his life was Saul on the Damascus road, encounters the glory of God in the risen Christ as a bright light. He is pursuing the followers of the way, as Christians would call them, called at that time. Individuals who were engaging in blasphemy because they believed that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God. And from this cloud, the risen Christ in a bright light comes to him and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Scriptures relate that the glory of God acts on behalf of human beings. God's glory is not to serve divinity. God's glory is to act for those whom he has created, you and me. God's glory in this passage from the Gospel of Luke reinforces for us as Christians that God continues to act for his people. God will act through Jesus as Messiah to lead humankind out of bondage from sin and death into life. Peter, James, and John have a vision of the future which will occur through Jesus' exodus. Somehow they have a vision of what will be accomplished in the future past Jesus' death and resurrection. They have much to learn yet themselves, but somehow they, they get a hint of the fact that the future can shape the present. I've enjoyed the movie series based upon the theme Back to the Future you know, featuring Michael J. Fox. It's a funny, funny series of movies. Where he gets in this mobile invented by his inventor friend, and they somehow they dash back into the future. They go back into the future. And what they learn in the future somehow can be beneficial in the present. For us who claim Christ as Lord and Savior, we are claiming that, and this passage on the Mount of Transfiguration, about the Mount of Transfiguration event, claims that for us. The future can shape the present. We have an inkling of what can happen through what Jesus, as the Messiah, will do for us through his exodus. He will not be a victim to the cross. He will be victor to the cross. And through his resurrection, by God's power, that will be manifested. And for those of us who claim him as Lord and Savior, we too will not be victims, but victors. The glory of God, the glory of God will act through Jesus as Messiah. And theologically, this Sunday, on this Transfiguration Sunday, we claim that and rejoice in it. But secondly, the glory of God acts through you and me. God's glory frees you and me to act on behalf of others. We get an inkling of this, that glory cannot be packaged and put in a shrine to be looked at and touched like some kind of rabbit foot if you want something to happen. You've got God packaged. Peter makes a helpful suggestion to Jesus, but Jesus rejects it. Lord, he said, let, let us make a booth, one for you and one for Elijah and one for Moses. Let's, let's package this event of glory. Let's be able to keep it so we can come back up in the mountain and look at it, you know, and touch it and know that it's here. Jesus rejects that. Why? Because it would be a perversion of glory. Glory is not to be packaged and contained. 
The glory of God as it touches a life is to transform that life so that life in turn can be a lantern and avenue for light and glory to others, enabling others to come to know of the power of God in Jesus Christ. So glory cannot be packaged and put in a shrine. Glory. Glory when it encounters you and me because of our faith in Jesus Christ is a, is a power which transforms us for service to others. The Apostle Paul talks about this, this, this growing into the glory of God when he writes in 2 Corinthians 3, saying the glory of God is reflected in a mirror, we are transformed into that image. Transformed into that image from degree to degree of glory. Meaning by that, that as we enable the power of God and Jesus Christ to work in our lives, we then are transformed to be God's instrument on behalf of others. Where we live, whenever we are breathing, we are a disciple of Christ to pass on the light of victory that we are not victims to life. We are victors to life. We are those who are not claimed by death. We are those who are claimed by life. We are not those who are claimed for tragedy, but for joy. We are not those claimed for despair. We are those who are claimed in Christ for hope. So Paul writes, be bold in your hope because of this glory which transforms us. But we do or are not transformed to package that in some kind of personal faith that only involves us. We miss the point of what it is to be a Christian if we think it's just between me and God and I don't have any responsibility for sharing the faith or living the faith or being involved in affairs of life where others come into contact with the, the victory of the gospel. When the power of the crucified, crucified and risen Lord hits us in terms of the working in us, we are transformed for service. There's a glimpse of that in terms of what is going on right now in Halifax Court in building together ministries a program begun about two years ago. It's a program which has enabled that community to come back to life degree by degree by degree. A Mr. and Mrs. Johnson moved into that community to engage in Christian social ministry, to put their faith in the practice. They left living in a nice home. They left all the perks, country club, all the other things which are part of success to become immersed in the community to show that the power of the gospel, the power of glory can make a difference in human lives and in the community. Psalm 99, we heard that God is holy. God is holy because God is concerned for equity and for righteousness in human affairs. No human being's worth is to be violated. And so as Christians, if we are transformed by the glory of God, we become those who become agents of transformation in terms of how we live our faith. And in building together ministries, that is going on. Erin Kesterson, a daughter of this congregation, a recent graduate of Duke University, is part of the staff. Mrs. Temple Sloan is a member of the Board of Directors of Building Together Ministries. Amazing things are happening over there. Through the influence of individuals, through the city, a police substation has been established at the corner of Peace and Blunt Streets, and you know that has claimed to the neighborhood because people care. Parents now can let their children be outside without the fear of a stray bullet striking one of them down. Their children can be outside without the fear of drugs being sold to them. Yes, there are still problems, but the number of robberies and rapes are down. Inside the building, which is a former public school, there is daycare, there is parenting classes, there are community meetings that enable these individuals to say, how can we claim our neighborhood to make it better? When the glory of God touches an individual, that has power when it is shared. The Church of Jesus Christ, we are in the business of enabling this glory to be reflected so that others come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. But if we believe that, then we are become agents of change in society. Ron Holt Niebuhr and Richard Niebuhr talks about, they talk about the transforming power of the gospel to change lives and institutions. And that's biblical. That is biblical. So the Church of Jesus Christ is to be an instrument of light. This congregation is to be an instrument of light. And we are that through 124 South Salisbury and our community outreach ministries. But we are to be instruments of life in terms of what we do 
in terms of our politics, in terms of our economics, in terms of our social concerns, enabling our faith to hit the road as rubber hits the road, the highway, so that what we claim in Christ can be a claim which claims the worth of others and enables others, too, to know that they have worth. The glory of God. When it hits you and me in terms of accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is to transform us so that we in turn, degree by degree, can grow into that glory. Reflecting God's glory because God's glory is always selfless. God's glory is always self-giving. And if we claim Christ, if we live in light of what Scripture communicates to us, we too are to be agents of transformation, enabling this light to shine through us. We are to be lanterns of the light, lanterns of the light. Well, Jesus had to come down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and he knew what was before him in Jerusalem. There he would die, die for you and me. But the power of God through Jesus would be a power which would enable him through that exodus experience of his crucifixion to death or to sin. The seasonal event begins this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. And during these weeks, these days, 40 days, we too move toward Jerusalem to understand afresh and anew what Jesus' death really means. And thus what Resurrection Day means, that there is a power as glory to transform us and to make a difference in the world. And so as we too journey to Jerusalem, we are those who are claiming the glory of the cross, which enables us to engage in the sacrifice of service to others, that the glory of God's transforming power may indeed be felt. Glory, not ours, but the glory which reflects God's love and compassion and justice and mercy that we too are those who have been freed from any form of bondage. And so we then are freed to be disciples of our Lord in life. Amen. Let us now affirm what we believe about our God as we say the words of the Apostles' Creed. All those who are able will please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, it was your blessed Son, Jesus, who revealed to his chosen disciples when he was transfigured on that holy mountain, the glory of your person. And in the midst of that glory, he spoke with Moses and Elijah of his crucifixion, which was to take place in Jerusalem for our eternal redemption from sin. We praise you for the glimpse of the mystery of our salvation. And we pray that beholding the brightness of our Lord's countenance, we may be strengthened to take up our cross and follow him as his disciples and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. So our Father, we ask you to transfigure us by your Spirit and let your love shine in all that we do and say that the world may see the radiant light of your divine glory as we reflect the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, within us. And, O oh God of infinite mercy, you have graciously invited all who are burdened and heavy laden to come to you for rest. And we would respond to that gracious invitation by bringing all of our cares to you because we know that you care for us. We come corporately and individually into your presence, not on our own merit, but through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we come, our Father, we also remember our friends before you. We ask you to comfort those who are ill, grant healing and health to all who are suffering affliction and pain, grant peace to those who are bereaved and feel their losses with the fullness of your mercy. Forgive all who have sinned. Strengthen the weak. Instruct the ignorant. Deliver the oppressed. Provide abundance for the needy, food for the hungry, and lodging for the homeless. And usher in a reign of peace for all who have been ravaged by war. And our God, as we have worshiped today and as we in a few moments go out from this place into our world and responsibility and the contact with our acquaintances and our fellow workers, we ask you to strengthen us in faith and prepare us to be your witnesses and help us to embrace the mystery of, of the cross and to open our hearts to its transfiguring power that we may truly walk in the paths of discipleship to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved us and who gave himself for us. It is in his name that we pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now worship our God with his tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, you have revealed the glory of your person in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And through him, you have revealed ourselves to us. We confess that we are sinners, and yet we are grateful that we have been called to be your servants and disciples, to be stewards of the blessing of God. Receive us in our gifts today. Transform them and use them for the work of your kingdom on earth. In Christ's name, amen. Our closing hymn today is number 430, Come Sing, O Church in Joy. We will sing the first and the second verses of this hymn. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us all. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>